oh my god, I should not have said this. <laughs> I, don't have to be I, just, I just personally need to know. <laughs> You gotta listen up, listen up. You gotta listen up, listen up. There's not a thing that I can get from you. Boy, I don't need that much, need that much. How can I tell you what I wanna tell you what I wanna do? I never needed you to give me. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. I'm looking forward to talking about science with you. Yeah, me too. Good. So, should we dive right in? Yes. Okay. Let's go for it. Can you tell me about your earliest memory of science? It, this is going to sound a bit stupid, but, but there are no stupid I think answers. it was um, so in one of my language classes, actually, mm -hmm. they had a chapter about Marie Curie. Okay. I think this was in second grade. Mm -hmm. And I remember being so impressed by her. That's that, really sweet. Yeah. So is that what prompted you to start pursuing science? Not at that point. Okay. I mean, at that point, I was just like, whoa, that's an incredible woman. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was more later on in middle school mm -hmm. uh, when I was thinking about what do I want to do with my life. I was a weird kid. I was already thinking about that in middle <laughs> school. <laughs> well, you get asked that a lot, too. At least True. I was asked that a lot. I never had a good answer. Yeah. But I really like sat down and thought about what do I want from my life, mm -hmm. and I was like, I want to do something that, um, I want to do some work that can live beyond my life, yeah. and I want to do something about s something that is an important issue to humanity, mm -hmm. and um, that's what made me think of the environment. And then I was like, oh, I could work on like water, air, and those kind of things, but. I like animals way more. Yeah. So maybe I should just work on animals. And that's kind yeah. of how I decided that's what I wanted to do. So when I was in ninth grade, mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to do a master's in wildlife science. That's what I'm going to do. So uh, well, how did then, what, what did you do next? How did you uh, follow that dream? So I, I really like looked up people who were doing that program, what they did before and everything. So it's like, okay, I'm going to do an undergrad in, so in India you have to pick a specific undergrad okay. right when you go in. Oh, wow. And then got my undergrad in zoology and then got into this master's program and did that. <laughs> For my PhD thesis, I'm looking at how birds and ants compete with each other and how that shapes where there are more species of birds versus more species of ants. Really? So um, in Eastern Himalayas, as in many other places mm -hmm. in the world, there are more birds at the middle of the mountain and there are almost no ants there. So huh. in cloud forests in a lot of different parts of the world, there are no ants or very few ants. And it's possible that the absence of ants leads to more birds, small mammals, all of these other groups that also eat insects, like a lot of ants eat insects. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the idea. Huh. So my thesis is to kind of test if that's true or not. And how did you come by this? Like, this seems like a particularly a very a niche thing. And, and I, how did you encounter that this was something that needed to be studied? So to be completely honest, it was an idea that my uh, advice I had, the rough mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. So he's been working in India for about 40 years now, mm -hmm. and he's been working in the Himalayas for a very long time. So he um, found this peak in bird diversity at the middle of the mountain. And one of the other previous graduate students in the lab noticed that there are almost no ants there. So he was interested in this question, and he wanted a student to huh. delve into it. And I grabbed the opportunity. That's really neat. Is that is that really common in like PhD programs where your thesis will stem from work that your advisor is doing? 
It depends on the program. So okay. a lot of times, especially in uh, molecular biology or things that require extensive lab setups, that is definitely true okay. because your, I mean, your research has to be related in some way to your advisors mm -hmm. because that's kind of how you would even be able to get good advice from them. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So um, there is always part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but some people have more independent research projects that they come up entirely on their own. And some people have more projects where they kind of just build on their advisor's work. Okay. So there's a whole, whole range of things there. Yeah, that makes sense. And you are involved with the soapbox science where people are, women are going to be getting up and talking about the, talking about the research, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that would be a nice opportunity for people to get to see a wide range of, it's all women, right? Yes. Who, who look at a bunch of different ways and get to see, oh, science and scientists can be all of these things. It doesn't have to be the, the grungy field scientists out in the field mm -hmm. with the baggy sweatpants on. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And also just the diversity of women they have too. Yeah. It's not, it's like there are a lot of women of color and that's really nice. Yeah. I'm very excited for it because, you know, I think a lot of people, when they look at me, they don't think I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't fit the stereotype at all. Right. So I'm looking forward to being the scientist at this event where, like, a whole lot of people will see me in that role. Yeah. Oh, and you get to be the representative, too, as of somebody who is a scientist when you do your work with uh, girls in STEM, right, and the middle school girls. Yeah. Uh, what's that like? It is so incredibly satisfying to be doing that work because, mm -hmm. and I think one big thing is that most things in science take a long time to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Like you do an experiment, things don't work, you do more, you, then you finally get some results, you write it up, you send, to, send it to a journal, gets rejected, revise it, yeah. send it again, gets rejected. So things take a long time. Mm -hmm. it, you don't get to see results that quickly. But to be involved in an outreach program like that, you get to see, you get to make a real difference in a shorter amount of time. Oh, that's neat. And that's really satisfying. Yeah. So um, I'm a part of this organization called Expanding Your Horizons Chicago, mm -hmm. and we organize an annual conference for middle school girls. And we, these girls come, they engage in hands-on workshops that are led by women role models in wow. STEM, so women STEM professionals. It's all kinds of activities from like extracting DNA from a banana to measuring speed of light using chocolate. What? Yeah, don't ask me how they do it. That's, <laughs> I don't know how particles work. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Like, wait, what? Tell me all. I should have gone and then I would know. <laughs> yeah, I should have sat in on that one. I messed up. You can't clearly. be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Then, and there's a, we also have a parent program on the side so where we get various people, um, so we get a bunch of women to talk about different STEM careers mm -hmm. with parents, and we get a bunch of people to talk about different STEM organizations mm -hmm. aimed at students, so then they know what they can do to help their kid have a career in STEM. We are thinking about expanding in other ways, and we mm -hmm. are looking for organizations to partner with, because I think that'll be a very good step ahead for us, yeah. where we do smaller satellite events through the year, and then this is the one big conference that the girls from all of those satellite events can go to. So that's yeah. that's the vision, but it's a good vision. Thank you. I like it. We need more, we need more, more people being involved in science, and even if they don't necessarily go on to become scientists, you know, having a background in science is just a science literacy, basic science literacy, and respect for science is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And even just the critical thinking, which is yeah. essentially what science is built on. Mm -hmm. It's important for everything. We all make decisions all the time. Yes. And being able to process the information in front of you to make a good decision. I'm paraphrasing one of my friends. OK. Just so you know. <laughs> just to give him due credit. OK. Uh, <laughs> we'll give but, him credit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's a very important life skill. Mm -hmm. We all have to use it all the time, and that's essentially what the foundation of science is. Yeah. Well, and and you know, we keep hearing about things like fake news and all that. But if people were able to use their scientific skills and the critical thinking skills that they can gain, yeah, right that amount would help. of yeah, right amount of skepticism. Yes. Knowing how to check sources. Yep. 
Yep. Also, like figuring things out for yourself, like building hypotheses, testing them, mm -hmm. coming up with good questions, and figuring out ways to answer them. That's essentially what science is. Yeah. What is your year like? Because you said you're in the field for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do the rest of the time? So the rest of the time, I do some amount of lab work. OK. Um, and I do mostly, I just sit on at my desk with my laptop and I either analyze data or I write. Okay. That's pretty much my life. Yeah. Interspersed with trips to India where you get to be chased by elephants. Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and collect ants and catch birds and yeah? take their poop. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I feel like everybody I know who works in biology has to deal with poop or urine at some point. Bodily things, fluids, right? it's, it, they're important. I mean, I think it's a step up for me because before yeah. this, the previous project I worked on was on bird sperm. So I was <laughs> handling semen. So I think um, poop is better. I'm very pleased <laughs> with my progress. How do you get bird semen? Okay, not. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known this was coming and I should not have said this. <laughs> I, don't have to be I, just, I just personally need to know. <laughs> It's not too bad. So um, male birds get this thing called cloacal protuberance only during the breeding season. Okay. So basically they're, so in birds, everything comes out through one hole. Okay. Which is called cloaca. Okay. And um, so they get like a swelling around the cloaca in okay. the breeding season. Okay. So also they store semen in these things, in these tubes called seminiferous tubules. So all you basically have to do is press the tubes, so like basically like press the bird where the tubes are. Okay. And then, so then the, it cannot go up, go back up. Mm -hmm. um, and then press from below, so then it just comes out. So it's so happy. And then you just take it, in a, you take it in a capillary tube, so you have a capillary tube ready, and uh -huh. then it just like sucks that up. And then you put it in a tube with formalin and that fixes it. That's beautiful. Yeah, that but it's wonderful. actually like pretty cool because sperm is the most diverse cell type. Really? Yeah. So like our skin cell would be relatively similar to the skin cell of another mammal, but sperm just vary enormously between huh. different species. So they're actually really interesting. Like, so Drosophila sperm in some species it's like three hundred times the length of the Drosophila of the fruit fly. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So huh. it, there's, there's like a crazy amount of variation in just the length, but also the head shape. So some animals have like the typical like mammal, like bulb shape thing. Mm -hmm. Birds have like a helical head. No. Yeah. And then some, some animals, like I think some mice have like this, a sickle shape head for the sperm. So there's, there's a whole range of variation in size and shape. It's actually a pretty cool cell. It's a do they all swim? Yes. Yes. Because it does not seem very aerodynamic. Well, that's just the head. They still have the tail. They're yeah, still like the if, flagellum. But if it's like a, a helix, that doesn't seem like it would go through liquid very well. Oh, it works but. really well, though. Yeah? It's like, it's like a, this, like a oh. spiral. Oh. Yeah. I wonder how it evolved like that. I don't know. It's actually very interesting that because there are these birds called bullfinches that okay. don't have it. They have like a very roundish... Thing. But the interesting thing is the bullfinches seem to be really monogamous. So most other birds have multiple mating. Okay. Or a whole bunch, of, like more than 90% of at least songbirds. Okay. Um, the females mate with multiple males. Okay. But bullfinches are extremely monogamous. That They don't, there's no extra pair mating. Oh. And they seem to have this really dull, boring sperm. <laughs> So the moral of the story is the more interesting the sperm, the more interesting the love life? Mm -hmm. That's another thing that usually people always thought of females as drab, and that's another thing that's been changing. And people have been working more on um, mutual mate choice and female coloration, things like that. But there are still a lot of species where males are definitely way flashier than females. But in humans, it's very confusing to think about it, because yeah. technically, we're sexually monomorphic. Which They're what? monomorphic, like we look similar, males and females. Oh. There isn't like a bright colored patch on the male or something like that. We do have some differences, yeah. but it's not too much. 
you know, then you look at like great. broadly what happens in the animal kingdom. We, we, our differences are relatively small. Yeah, it's a really good point. I haven't thought about it like that before. Yeah, but there are a lot of cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Which, but with the cultural differences, it mostly seems to be that the females are more ornamented. Yeah. And that I, yeah, I don't know how it works. It's very confusing when you think about how culture influences our biology. And I definitely true? don't have a good handle on it. No, no. Do you study anything like that? No. Okay. I didn't yeah. think that you did. I was just checking. Yeah. I just think about it sometimes, but I'm just always very confused when I think about humans. Well, yeah, it's fascinating to think about. Humans, we're, we're confusing, we're confusing species. Yeah. I am often confused myself. <laughs> so. so one of our keynote speakers at EY at Chicago last year, Eugenia Cheng, yeah. um, she just did an interview with BBC and um, it's an absolutely wonderful interview and I highly recommend listening to it. Okay. Where she talks about how she was good at math, but she was never the best, especially when she went um, into her like undergrad program where she was majoring in math. There were a fair number of boys who were better than that, mm -hmm. but she was always um, persistent. She would keep at the problems. And that's really the skill that you need as a researcher. Because it takes time to solve problems. Yeah. And so when, when it got to the advanced stages where you were actually doing research, she outperformed them because she was practicing the skill of pers pers like being persistent at solving problems the whole time. And it was just an amazing thing to listen to. That's incredibly inspiring. Yeah. And like, I was terrible at dissections. I'm a biologist now. <laughs> I was always horrible at dissections. Yeah. I could never get the right things out. I was <laughs> terrible at making figures because I, I just can't draw. But I am a biologist. Yeah. And you're out there kicking ass and being a biologist and about to get your PhD. Yeah. Yeah. How do your first memories of science impact what you're doing now? It impacts me in the way that I realize now that I, I read about Madame Curie in a language class where it was just a story. But there aren't enough stories of women in science out there, you know. That was literally the one name I knew for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do with all my work, just being a woman of color in science is an important thing right now. And, but also at the same time doing work to promote women in science, to promote stories of women in science, to increase our representation. And I think that's, that's the common thread between the, yeah. those experiences. Wonderful. So before I let you go, please, so I'm gonna ask you two questions. An action for citizens of science on how they can support it, and an action for organizations on how they can support science. So if you're a rich organization, <laughs> donate. <laughs> Especially to local programs. Yeah. There are a lot of smaller groups for which even like, so EY at Chicago, for instance, we run on a budget of about $5,000. Wow. Which is like nothing for yeah. a lot of the bigger organizations. It's everything for us and it's everything for about 200 middle school girls that come to our program. If you're not a rich organization, there are still a lot of ways of contributing, partnering with groups, giving them resources. So a lot of science groups tend to be formed by people similar to me that are scientists. We all have similar skill sets. Mm. We don't have skill sets that other people might have, like marketing, fundraising, yeah. stuff like that, which is very useful for an organization. And for individuals, I think, just volunteer your time if you can. Yeah. And I mean, money always helps, but just finding, finding the organization that works in your neighborhood, in your city, mm -hmm. and helping them out. You have been amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it was you wonderful so talking much. to you. <laughs> I hope you had a good time. Yeah, this and is I'm going to give you another high five.